All right. And now we get to talk about old books. Finally. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, right work. So, uh, so I'm going to start out so that the uh, kind of title of the lecture is uh, Haunted Books or Practical Bibliomancy. Um, so I'm going to start out with a little, of a, a little story um, that's going to lead into what I'm talking about. So um, several years ago, a friend of mine who's not here at the moment, uh, Megan Blapas, um, had her family down. And her family has done uh, table tapping for like a century, um, which is basically where people sit around a table, you put your hands face down on the table, and then everybody in the room like, does like basically a chant, which might take anywhere from apparently sometimes 10 minutes to, in my experience, like an hour. And then, lo and behold, the table starts moving up without any, and I'm not, all I'm saying is this thing occurred and I cannot explain it. It's all that I said, as far as I'm going, but it did happen. And it's like, and it starts going in answer to questions, right? So they're doing this in my house and they're asked, asking questions that you, kinds of questions you ask, you know, you know, or, you know, da -da -da -da, who's, you know, you know, do you live in this house? <laughs> no, okay. And then somebody has a great question of saying, uh, you know, are there any, you know, are there any ghosts in the house? And it goes, <laughs> yes. And then they're like, well, how many? And it goes, <laughs> 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 it's hovering in the air and I'm like you have to ask that <laughs> um, and then I'm like and I think about it I'm like are the ghosts in the books Boom! and I'm like yes <laughs> so um, and then I was like is one of them in the Gautier's comedy of death Boom! I thought so. <laughs> and I went and did a few other guesses, and I think I was about 75% right. Um, or 75% coincidental. I don't know. But anyway, um, so that, that kind of got me, got me thinking, like, what, you know, there's a sense in which any book that has been used and loved by a person is haunted in a certain sense. And there is a certain sense where without having to make recourse to ghosts, um, interacting with books in a particular way as objects and as relics as opposed to interacting with them as texts um, is a way that you are actually kind of resurrecting a person or parts of a person and actually if you really want to look at it closely you can make the argument that you're actually inviting yourself to be possessed by previous readers depending on the way you interact with these objects and so um, I thought this is kind of an interesting lens to look at how and why uh, one would spend more money on an old book because for a long time when I was collecting books, I would never. I was like, give me the Dover Thrift Edition. It's like, give me the proletarian cheap thing. I just want to read it. I'm not an aristocrat. And so this is kind of you know, eventually figuring out. No, there is actually there are other things going on there, and it's not monetary. None of these have a great well. Few of these have much monetary value because because they have been loved by a person, which makes it valueless in terms of money, as we know. It, it, it for a certain kind of collector. Um, and of course, so most of these are dealing with old avant-garde stuff, like I talked about in yesterday's lecture, that nobody has any idea who they are, which also keeps it cheap. So um, I just wanted to kind of look at some of the books which uh, include the ones that the table said were haunted, and also include some that I just think are interesting to look at in, in that way. And we're going to kind of look at different ways you can pay attention to aspects of the physical book that tell you things about past readers that sometimes can be kind of surprisingly intimate um, in a way. Um, certain ways of interacting with the book can put you inside the head of the person, but other ways can put you inside that person's nervous system, their musculature, how do they, what's their posture, um, you know, what did it, what did their house smell like, things like that. Um, what's that? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right, yeah, and, and yeah, this person liked coffee a lot. That's all of mine, <laughs> right. So, um, so I'm going to 
talk about these. I'm going to pass them around, um, which will make over half of you extraordinarily nervous. Rightfully so, but um, also, you know, I, I, I know already. It's, it's off. It's cool. Um, so, uh, I am going to talk a little bit about how to hold a fragile book. Maybe not this one's beyond fragile. Um, don't pick it up by the cover, please, ever. Rest it in your palm, the spine on your palm, and just make sure that your hand is covered. This cover is detached. You can still do how to do it. So it's up to you how much you want to interact with them. But I'm not, the point of having them here is for you to interact with them. So, you know, that's why I'm passing them around. Uh, there's not too much you can do to like this thing. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, so, um, yeah, and the paperbacks especially, just so you know, the paperbacks can be pretty fragile, um, especially. So, um, actually I'm going to talk about this one first, uh, because this was actually the first, um, the first antique book that I bought, and this was way before I was even thinking about putting together an archive or a collection or anything like that. I was in college and I was uh, really into 18th century gothic fiction, like I assume most people are when they're 20. <laughs> um, and all you can find by Monk Lewis in these pre-internet days was uh, the Monk. And I was like, what else did this guy write? And so I actually just found a copy in a used bookstore from 1809, the year Poe was born, for what that's worth, or Petrus Burrell. Um, and, um, and it looked like this, and I was like, this, this looks like a haunted book. I was like, Hell, yeah, I'm buying that shit. Because it cost me like $12 because it's falling apart. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, I think, and there is something appropriate that there is this kind of gothic image, I think, that is pretty deep in our culture of like the old decaying book that retains some kind of a magic, whether it's a magical book or it's just the magic of thought concretized, which is really what a book is. And I think there is a sense that you, this, you know, books, books decay like the human body decays. But there are some important differences. A, they decay much slower. B, they decay while they're still alive. That's actually not a difference. But, uh, <laughs> but they're, they, they live through a much longer part of that decay. So you, there is a sense where I almost feel like you're reading out of a corpse when you're reading out of a book this old, <laughs> at least if you read a lot of Gothic fiction. Um, so, uh, so that, this really I just got because it's the only way to read this stuff, which has changed a lot now, thanks to the internet and, and the internet archive and things like that. But, um, so I'm going to pass that around. Um, and it's a gothic fiction book, so it just seemed appropriate. Um, ba -ba -ba -ba. Um, so, yeah. Um, I'm going to talk about about the idea of bibliomancy a little bit, which, you know, would be like necromancy is raising the dead, bibliomancy would be raising the dead from a book. Um, and there are a few ways you can kind of do that. The traditional sense is actually be using books for prophecy, which we're going to play with in a little bit for a minute here. Um, you know, and, and we'll, uh, but before we get into that, um, I'm going to talk about again just kind of this idea of resurrecting the readers of these books, not the writers of the books. Um, the text is where the writer lives, but the book is where the reader lives, would be one way to kind of think about it, I think. Um, so, um, yeah, and, and, and again, the text can almost be immortal, but the book will never be immortal. Although it will last a lot, last a lot longer than digital books, believe it or not. Um, yeah, so um, I'm going to take a look at this, which is gives us a pretty definite idea of how this bibliomancy can work. This is a copy of Klopstock's Messiah, which is a German romantic epic poem about Jesus. Um, what makes this, uh, it's not a poem I'm particularly interested in, what makes this book interesting is the writing in it and the way that it's been personalized, which is often, this is an obvious way of personalizing. Um, so this book was a gift by a woman named Catherine Drage. Um, on May 9th of 1817, 
she bought this book and she gave it to her uncle on his deathbed as he was dying of alcohol, according to her inscription, dying of alcoholism, which could mean a number of things, but you know. And so you open it up and she's written an essay on drunkenness, or drunkenness actually, because it's old enough. Um, and the, writes it all the way down, she ran out of room, and so she just turned it around and then started writing across this direction, which is a good way of saving paper. Um, also in here, one of the really beautiful things about old books, sometimes a little surprise, is this one you find, I'm hoping I find it this time, um, things people have left into books, which is something I do a lot. I'll just like leave something in there. 200 years from now, somebody can wonder what the hell it meant. You'll probably find some of those in these actually as you go through. Um, with most of these, I've actually marked where some of the interesting stuff in the book is, so you can kind of look at that, find those. In here, we have a laurel leaf, I would assume probably from his grave. Mm. So really, if you want to take an actual, bit, an actual magical kind of uh, approach, this would probably be a pretty prime candidate for, for being haunted. Um, and so, you know, you get this, and then on here he has, you know, Stonebridge, Isaac Fer uh, Ferrard died on Friday, May 9th, 1817, at 10 minutes before 11 in the morning. Uncle to the above, Catherine Drage, age 49, buried Monday the 12th at Thorny, Cambridgeshire, or something like that. So, um, so you have here, like, it's, it's really at this point, I think it's less clock stock, and it's more <coughs> really a relic of a man's, a man's death and, and the whole kind of family dynamic that surrounded that death and whatever preceded that death, so. Um, <laughs> That paint's dry, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know it is. Um, so, um, yeah, so it's a kind of a, a good example of kind of how that works. Um, so, and then you've got a book like this. How do you actually do the bibliomancy? You know, you, you've got the potential for it. How do you kind of figure out who was reading? How do you put yourself into that? Um, it depends on the book being used. A book that somebody has bought and put on their shelf for 40 years and then passed on to their kids, you're not going to be able to do much with it. You know, beautiful book, beautiful text, but you're not going to have much personality um, imprinted upon it. Um, so really, in this sense, the, a, book, a book serves as a depository of the residue of a person's life would be the way to look at it. And so what you can do is use that residue to not entirely build a complete picture of that person, but you can find at least one weird little salient aspect of a person that you can reconstruct with a weird clarity sometimes, even if the rest of it is all still kind of abstract. Um, but it's a residue of their, their thought and a residue of their daily life um, and their context. Um, and really, if you think about it, what, you know, what are you doing when you're reading? You're trying to change yourself. You're trying to build yourself. So this is actually a relic of a person's attempt at growth, um, which is an interesting thing to inject yourself into or to inject into yourself. Now it feels like I'm talking about drugs. Um, so just got a little bit more interesting. Um, so uh, yeah, so this is kind of one difference between like a certain kind of collector um, who, uh, like I actually went to, to get some of my books valued to a local bookseller and when they found out that I sought out books with marginalia um, in history, they told me I should throw the books away because they were worse than useless. <laughs> <laughs> I did not do it. Unless the owner is famous. If the owner is the person writing Well, she told me that, in fact, because this was a thing. I said, well, it's actually interesting because you can actually use this stuff for scholarship. I'm like, some of these are you know, by people we can trace. And she goes, oh, well, if someone's famous, then they're allowed to write in a book. <laughs> and I was like, well, how would the person when they're 20 know they're going to be famous and that they therefore have the right to personalize the book? And then she changed the subject <laughs> um, and told me that although she, she said, although, you know, she says, I hate to discourage someone who thinks they're a book collector. <laughs> but anyway, kind of aside, but, uh, but there is that attitude. This is the exact opposite approach toward collecting books. Um, yeah, and, and it's, there is another kind of collector. It's not like I'm the only person who cares about this kind of thing. I'm just, 
there, there are various approaches. Um, and so there's also there's a, a tradition of, um, obviously a tradition of bibliophiles and readers and archivists. You know, I, I, could, I could tell you the, the, the bibliophiles who have influenced my own practice, like bibliophile Jacob in the 1830s, or Georges Daly in the 1870s and 80s, people like that. Um, which is another thing that works into these. Sometimes it's, the, you know, again, like this owner of the book. Um, but what you'll find if you look into kind of the history of that kind of thing is there is a tendency for almost for books to find people in a way um, where, you know, just uh, you, you can get uncannily lucky with certain things. And I'll, I'll kind of touch on this few, few places where that's happened here. One of the famous examples. Rémy de Gourmand, who was an avant-gardist in the 1880s and 90s, he mentored Alfred Jarry, worked in the Bibliothèque Nationale in, uh, in Paris, and came upon at random a, mis, uh, a, a misfiled book that had never actually been sold by a guy who called himself the Comte de l'Entremont. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else who would have found that book would have said, what the hell is this? I feel dirty from even having opened the cover and put it back. The person who found it was probably one of the like 50 people in France who would look at it and say, this is fucking brilliant. And this then goes on to become one of the founding texts of, of Dada on surrealism. And actually, even symbolism took a big turn at the point that Gourmand finds this, gets it republished. So, the real name of L'Autremont is Isidore Ducasse. Uh, jump forward about 30 years, um, and you've got the surrealist Paul Elouard, who has decided that in order to try to get inside <coughs> L'Autremont's mind, he's going to read every book quoted in the book that Ducasse published on his own called Poesies, which is a bunch of plagiarisms of hundreds, <laughs> uh, parts of hundreds of other uh, like 18th and early 19th century texts. So he's like, I'm just going to read all of these. So he starts tracking them down in these bookstores, ends up finding a copy with marginalia by Ducasse. Again, what are the chances of that happening? This is kind of an interesting thing. Um, so, you know, so there are these kinds of, I don't know, relationships that you build up with books and with the potentiality of books. Um, as you kind of undertake this practice. And again, whether it's coincidence or not, it's interesting. Um, so, and there's a sense too, if you want to kind of really follow up this uh, kind of conceit into ridiculous territory, you can even look at like published bibliographies as a kind of grimoire, it's a spell. And that's kind of what Elward was doing. How do, I, how do I achieve what this person achieved? Well, let's follow their recipe of reading. You know what I mean? So that's another way you can kind of uh, uh, interact with this kind of stuff. Um, so in relation to that, I'm going to pass around a, uh, yeah, okay, I trust you go. I'll take it out of the plastic. Um, <laughs> this is a, uh, another one of the, the bibliophiles I should have mentioned as a big influence uh, is uh, uh, Jules Clarity, who again, was one of the, the, the main historians of the avant-garde in the 1860s, one of the, the people who made sure that the original movements were not forgotten. Um, this is a, an invoice from him to a bookseller asking for specific books that he's trying to track down for that research, um, uh, including the Annales Romantique, which is also on my list, and I've got this is a, an anthology that ran for about 12 years in the 1830s of, of avant-garde stuff. The two years that he's asking for are also the two years I have not been able to find affordably. So somehow that hasn't changed. Um, so uh, I'll pass that around because this is, again, it's just kind of this, you know, a very banal part of daily life, but those banal parts of daily life are actually what create our consciousness. Um, what kind of book would you say gets written in, that's not meant to be written in, that gets written in the most? Textbooks. Textbooks would be the other part. Yeah. yeah. Actually, but you're, this is why they say never to ask a rhetorical question. Because you're both right. What would be the other one? Children's books. Children's books. Thank you. <laughs> 
So here's an early edition. I was going to bring a bunch of textbooks, and I forgot actually for that for that exact reason, um, because textbooks are really great for this kind of, of thing. Uh, but I forgot because they're in a different bookshelf. So this is an early edition of Alice in Wonderland, um, an 1871 edition. It's not. I mean, you're not going to be able to afford an edition that's earlier. Um, it belonged to a universalist church, which is kind of interesting. Um, and yeah, you can. There, we'll, we'll be looking at a few things with children, you know, children writing in them. But you know, children's books have been loved more than almost any kind of book. Typically, that's a difference between a Bible and a textbook. Um, the children's books they, they're into. Um, and I really like really torn up, messed up children's books because you can every little bit of the kids little daily life is kind of in there, and it's, it's, it's eating away at the text in a weird way. And if you want to talk about like people at the beginning of like trying to figure out who they are, you can't do that any more than a children's book. Yeah. Um, another children's book here, which has also been deeply loved, as you can see, this is called Mr. Trong uh, by Jean Fleury, who was a uh, realist. He actually wrote most of the realist manifestos for Courbet, who was not a theorist, really. Um, or at least not in terms of a rhythm theorist. Um, uh, also one of the first historians of the avant-garde. And um, for most of the 19th century, and well into the 20th century, especially in Russia, if you were, if you were writing avant-garde work, the only way you could really get the really most extreme stuff out there is either to call it comedy or a children's book. Um, and so this is uh, Mr. Trongle, which is about a guy uh, the kind of typical middle class, standard, mainstream kind of bourgeois who um, uh, has a kind of, you know, kind of wants to like marry into money basically. And so he's, he wants to go and impress this guy, this, you know, guy who can marry his daughter. And he sees this devil costume in a store and he buys the devil costume and immediately loses his middle classness and just runs rampant through Paris like fucking with stuff. Um, and so you can look at it and you're like, okay, I see why you wanted kids to read this as an avant-garde artist, but it, it can still just be a little thing. So this is really torn up too. Um, and uh, again, I don't really see that. Feel the kid in there. Um, so there's a sense here where, you know, again, to get to reading, if you're reading, Inherently, reading is a matter of merging two minds. You know, reading, reading is an activity which destroys consciousness. It Detroit destroys subjectivity and reconfigures it. It does it so quickly we're not aware of it. But you, in order to read, you're letting other people's thoughts into your mind. And then they get in there and they do something different. Or you're, maybe you're letting a reflection of a thought. It's not the actual thought, but it's something that comes out of the thought, you know. Um, but again, they don't ever actually meet. You're not becoming that person. Elvard was never going to become Isidore Ducasse. But there is a kind of a conversation happening there. And it's a conversation which is happening on a weird level that's difficult to psychologically untangle. Um, so there is a sense, at least sophistically, where um, you are really kind of being partially possessed when you allow yourself to read something, especially if you're really reading it properly. Um, so there's a sense there where bibliomancy in this regard, you could look at this a matter of not reading the text, but reading the book itself. Um, uh, when you're reading an old book, you're reading a kind of a, an amalgamation of the text and whatever other previous readers were in there. Typically, of course, we block out all of the awareness of the physicality of the book. We block out everything that tells us who this person was because we're focused on the text. But if you can reverse your, your approach toward reading, you can start to see these things scintillate against each other in, in, in interesting ways. Um, so, um, yeah, and if you think about it, if you want to look at like magical theory, it always requires a piece of the subject or a trace of the subject. You need a piece of hair or a laurel leaf from the grave or whatever, if you want to get into like voodoo or hoodoo. So, you know, these are compelling metaphors. Um, um, Bibliomancy then uses both the physical, the physical traces of the reader and the intellectual traces of the reader. 
The intellectual traces come through marginalia, underlining stuff, dog-eared, dog-earing stuff. This is what this person liked. They didn't even cut these pages. They didn't do a shit. You know, um, and that's kind of, and then also reading, and then if you're reading the, the kind of body of the reader, you're looking at where is it, where's the wearing on the spine? Where is the, where have they spilled coffee? Where have they, you know, what? They, are they flipping the pages so fast they're tearing them? What's with this guy? You know? Um, yeah, so um, let's take a look at. Um, gonna take a look. This is one of my older books, so I mainly focus on the 19th century. Um, this is uh, technically the Lubrications of Isaac Bickerstaff, Esquire. Um, this is from 1723, so this is an old book. Um, this is basically a, it's a compilation of issues of the Tatler, which was one of the very first um, journals um, in London, kind of really big part of coffee, kind of, ugh, coffee house culture. Um, and it has a little description here, which I really can't read. If anyone wants to help me out with that, you're welcome to, but this is why I don't like cursive. Um, but, <laughs> at any rate. Um, um, if you want to know what the very beginning of the 18th century smelled like, you can. And if you do that, and then wait till a book from like, let's say the next one I'm going to send around comes around from 1890, you'll notice a different smell. Of course, it's not just like everything smelled like this in 1730. <laughs> but. What you are looking at is, you know, one particular interior. Somebody, all the air they breathed when they were thinking their hardest was probably smelled something like this, um, minus, you know, whatever the acid's done to the paper. If you have, <laughs> if you have allergies, don't that is a good point. Yes, <laughs> right. Yeah, probably a good point. Yeah, you don't want two hundred year old dust. No <laughs> man, this book's getting stuck down there. What's that? <laughs> that stuck down there. Uh oh, no, we got a weird knot down there, right? Maybe you could throw some of them this way. That way, oh, I might do that. It was just well, yeah. I'll start doing that too. All right. I'm gonna take a stab at this knot. Yeah, right. I know. I, most bibliophiles I know, that's the first thing they do when they open the book. <laughs> An old book. It is, right? It is, it is distinct, and it, it, it is distinct from, I'll pass this it one around the same direction. Distinct, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> distinct. <laughs> distinct. Uh, um, that might also have to do with the way the books are made, um, there the materials are involved. a lot of factors in leather, there. The leather, the blues, the type of paper, yeah. the ink, the type of paper. Yeah. So the hundred years that might have changed probably have a hundred years. Right, right, yeah. But all, still all of those factors converging on that moment. Um, but yeah, it is, uh, yeah, it, it's, 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 it's a complicated, it's a complicated bouquet. <laughs> um, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this one around the same time so that you can compare it with something that's quite a bit later. Um, this is from 1890. Pastels and Prose is a, 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 one of the first um, anthologies of French avant-garde work translated into English. And these are all prose poems um, from the French avant-garde, uh, put together by Stuart Merrill, who's an American avant-gardist who uh, was an expatriate, went to Paris, refused to write in English, um, and except when he was translating, apparently. Um, but this one is interesting um, in that it uh, belonged to a guy named James Garfield, which weirdly didn't strike any bells with the bookseller, apparently, because I bought this for 25 bucks. <laughs> this is not the president, it is the president's son, who was with his father when his father was assassinated, um, um, and later became one of uh, Teddy Roosevelt's closest political advisors and helped to set up the national park system. But apparently also was really into the 19th, or at least enough into the 19th century avant-garde to buy the book. This book has not been very heavily read, however, so I don't know how much he was reading it and how much it was like given to him or something. But, uh, but it does have a nice, really nice book label. Um, and I've got, I mainly got it here as kind of 
uh, compare and contrast with the other one. Um, so yeah, I'm um, going to talk a little bit about practical, I'm going to call it practical bibliomancy because I like the term. Um, so bibliomancy as a form of, um, of uh, future telling, I guess. This has been practiced by the Egyptians, it was practiced by the Greeks, it was practiced by the Romans, by the medievals, um, by medieval priests. I mean, the Bible, obviously, you're going to use the Bible to tell the future, right? Um, you know, the alchemists, occultism, it's a pretty widespread practice. The theory is that if the future, if the future proceeds from the past, then that must mean that the past contains the seeds to the future. And so if you can identify those seeds in the right context with the right question, then you know, it can somehow reveal what's going to occur. And this usually involves chance processes. Um, so the most common form of that is what's called drawing sorts, um, which is basically where you ask a question, you open the book at random, um, put your finger down, and that's your answer, whatever that means. Um, so just try that. Um, let's see, what should we try with? Who's got the clock stop book? That's a good one to use. Jim, you got the clock stop? Do you want to draw sorts for us? <laughs> that sounds like a yes to me. All right, what should we ask the book about the future? When will it be blank? <laughs> All right. So just open it up, choose a passage at random, we'll see what our answer is. What was the question? Was the question? When will it be blank? <laughs> when will it be blank? <laughs> the answer will make as much sense as the question, so. <laughs> so is the meaning of how leaving the gloom and solitude walk towards its silence, that after such suffering, such lonely anguish, the mighty glory of solace Man. It's going to be a long, hard path. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> That's great. Um, so this, you know, and, and you're always going to get answers that don't make sense. You know what I mean? In, in, in any regard, in any straightforward way, which is also the way it was with every, this way it is with every oracle ever. You know what I mean? It's always poetry. It's always poetry, and you can make, I mean, there's a, there's a reason that this practice of drawing sorts then gets picked up by the Dada's and the Surrealists. In fact, depending on who you ask and the endless arguments about it that the Dada's occupied themselves with, one of the stories about how da, the name Dada was chosen was that it was drawn with sorts. They opened a book, a uh, dictionary at random, I think it was supposed to be a French-German dictionary, went poof, and it landed on the word Dada. You know, what's that? It meant a hobby horse, apparently, like a, one of the you know those things. Okay. Um, there are other stories too, like, but that I like that one better because it doesn't involve anybody trying to like make a power play over each other, <laughs> which most of the others do. Like, no, I came up with it. No, you didn't. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Um, so yeah. Another thing that I've kind of noticed in, in my own practice is that there are certain authors who seem to inspire especially engaged reading by the people who like them. Just people like, you know, so um, the, in my own experience, particularly Ambrose Bierce, people who like Ambrose Bierce like to write in their books. People who like Gautier really love to, I'm going to talk about in a minute. People like Gerard de Nerval. And it tends to be poets who are kind of, um, kind of underground, kind of classic kind of people, like stuff who, are, who have a very small but extremely intense following. Um, so I've got an Ambrose Bierce here, Tales of Soldier and Civilians. This is a first edition, which is pretty rare. Um, and you can kind of start to get an idea. I mean, okay, if it's just the book, you're like, this person liked Bierce. First off, if it's a first edition, it tends to mean something beyond that, which is whoever buys the first edition of a book usually was waiting for it to come out. When they buy the third edition of the book, it's usually because they read a review and said that sounds good. <laughs> so this is for me, like first, I don't care really about first edition in terms of like, oh, it's more rare or drives the value up or whatever. 
But what is interesting when I get a first edition is that there's a higher chance, a higher probability that the person who read this was already involved in the communities that this text emerged from. Um, and then a lot of the time readers would put other kind of clues as to what, what it is that connects them to this. So here we've got um, it's, it's this first edition. It's got a bunch of stuff in here. First off, newspaper clippings. So there's one here which is an uh, uh, article about beer by H.L. Mencken, which was tipped into the book when I bought it, um, which tells you, at least tells you they read the Mencken. Also, there's, this is really interesting, clipping from the St. Paul Pioneer Press, which is when they figured out what probably happened to Beers, because he disappeared in Mexico. Um, this is the article where they figured out that he was likely executed by Pancho Villa. Um, he was covering, he was a, a reporter covering the case, and what seems to have happened was that they were uh, executing prisoners, and he tried to step in. Um, and uh, that was the end of it. So, the, first off, you know this person was following Beers's, um, you know, he's, they're following throughout their entire life. This is not an author or a book that they forgot about. Um, but also we have the book played in here, Tully M. Sanders, from among the books of Tully M. Sanders. So I looked into Tully M. Sanders, it's pretty interesting. It was Tully M. Sanders and M. J. Sanders. The latter is written in in pencil here. Um, so Tully M. Sanders, turns out, was born in Nashville in 1869. Um, mother from Pennsylvania, father's from Indiana. Lived in St. Paul um, by 1900 in a rented apartment. This is not all from the book. This is from actual research. But um, he was the uncle of a guy named David Lloyd, who is a radical evolutionary theorist. Who's I've got one of his books, and it looks extremely crazy. But he apparently used to teach at Princeton. Um, he's like a utopian theorist. Um, and he's got this book called Grave Laughter, which is a book-length memoir of his family about the guy who owned this book. So Tully M. Sanders made a big enough impression on his nephew that he later wrote an entire book about him. And what he talked about was um, that he, so apparently he was a tax lawyer, but he just remembered like him doing constant, telling stories constantly, and constantly reading out of his library to the kids, right? Um, every Sunday he would hold a gathering at his house where he would have a bunch of high school kids come in and they would do dramatic readings from like uh, comic books. It's like dramatic readings of Little Nemo and the Cats and, uh, cats and Jammer kids. Um, and then it's kind of set up an informal school there kind of a shadow school for all these you know, kids in the area who wanted to learn stuff outside of what was being taught at the school, um, and things like that. Um, so uh, yeah, playing writing games, and he was apparently an advisor for the high school newspaper. So it's just, you know, I, this little like book plate kind of unfolds into kind of creating this whole picture of who this guy was and what his effect was on other people and things like that, so. Um, let's see, which way are we going? This way, I think. Uh, okay, so he's one, in my own experience, the author who I have most often found having crazy stuff happening with the books is uh, Théophile Gautier, who um, some of you will remember from the, maybe from the lecture yesterday. Um, he was, um, he, he basically mentored most of the people in the second and third and fourth generation avant-garde. He was an extremely important member of that community. Um, and so it kind of makes sense that people are particularly engaged in his work, um, or particularly engaged in this, in this particular way. So I have a few really interesting Gautier books here. This one, which is the Romance and Comte, um, was owned Owned by a guy named uh, C.K. Moses, originally. Well, it's, it's gone through a number of people. I have not found anything out about the C.K. Moses guy. Somebody, this is always interesting to me when this happens. 
somebody owned it before that, and somebody else rubbed their name out of the book. <laughs> and I've got a few books where that happens, and I'm like, is this... There's no explanation for it that doesn't seem a little bit crazy to me. Like, either you're like, I hate this guy. Or you're like, I, nobody else can have read this book already before me. This is mine now. No trace of anyone else, which actually seems crazier to me. It's like that kind of terror, almost an existential terror of having, of sharing this object with another person. I think it actually tells you something about the power of that, of this experience. That even if they, I, you know, even if they, in their own mind, they're just like, well, this looks bad. This is mine now. There's something weirder and deeper beneath that, I think. Um, is there any trace of all of the thing? Yeah, a little is bit. It's smudge? It's mostly, I, it's, I, it might be lip, lippens, lippincott, maybe. You can get little bits. The other thing, I don't think a thing is stolen. Yeah. Their name. Well, that's possible. Yeah. That is possible. Stolen from somebody they knew or something. Right. Well, yeah. I like that story. It's a better story. <laughs> 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 um, yeah. Right. Now, the, the, the first owner that I can trace is a guy, um, and this is, again, so I, this cost me like $6 for this reason, right? Um, be, but then I look at him like, okay, well, you know, who, uh, who is this uh, Earl Wentworth Huckle guy? Well, it turns out he was a Harvard student who was a student of a guy named F.C. Sumacrist, who is the only person prior to me who has translated Théophile Gautier. So the big, you know, there was one big collected works published in English around 1900 by the Sumacrist guy. This is his student. This was, so what that means is, okay, we go through here and he's got some notes, not everywhere, but Little notes here about the text. Um, he's got one where he compares Gautier to. So I, I, will, I would always kind of been thinking, why was Gautier? Because Gautier had this weird popularity in English for about ten years in the early century, and then disappeared. And it's partly because Eliot and a lot of those guys were reading it. But I was like, what? It seems kind of odd to me. What? What did people like about him? What did mainstream normal people like about Gautier? Well, there's a little thing down here where he has a whole little section where he talks about how Gautier is essentially like Robert Louis Stevenson. And I'm like, okay. But it does explain that that's the way that people are thinking about it, why he was becoming popular. It also tells me something. If this is the book he was, bought, he was using in class with the guy who translated Gautier, this actually tells me, this, this actually tells us, you know, what, how did English readers encounter Gautier at this time? You know, what, you know, what is the perspective of the only translation we have available? You know, which is pretty interesting, I think. Um, you can kind of start to reconstruct this, because he's probably largely parroting what he's hearing from his teacher. Um, um, so, yeah, pretty interesting, I think. Um, for what it's worth, that guy later, he goes, he went on to work with uh, Walter Lippmann and John Reed, and then he later became uh, an aide in the Graphic Arts, di Arts Division of the National Museum and wrote like stuff on art history and things like that. So it is a book that he probably went back to and used. Um, <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> um, and then we got it. So we've got that, and then we've got this, which is, this is the book when, uh, when the question came up, you know, when they were like, yeah, there are like 8,000 ghosts in your house, and I was like, is it this book? This is the book, I guess, first, incorrectly. Another book by Gautier. So again, you know, we're getting a lot of this. Um, and so this book is really interesting. Again, I bought it for like $15 because somebody completely ruined it by putting collage inside, <laughs> right? But uh, some other interesting things here, you can actually trace some pretty interesting stuff because you can trace, again, you can trace here the avant-garde's, or at least some avant-gardists' relation to Gautier over several generations here as it passed from one person to the next. So the first owner, I don't have names for any of these, but you can look at the marks because it's very heavily marked in various ways. The first owner 
Um, if you look at the in the back, has added alternate titles and little notes, contextual notes about the poems to the table of contents, which tends to imply, um, and also a, a Rachel Bresson, who comes to art right quite a bit, as a handwriting analyst, and was like, this person, this is from the same period as Gautier. This is probably somebody who, if they did not know Gautier personally, knew friends of Gautier, because this is information that would have been pretty difficult. It would have taken a tremendous amount of dedication to have found this at this any other way. Um, and so you probably got first it being when it first came out, someone who was like, "Oh, Gautier's got a book coming out finally," because they probably only heard him reading in like people's living rooms until this point, or read him in newspapers. Um, so that's your first owner. Second owner only has a few things in here. But you, we know that it is a poet because, also, see that first little corrections in here from that first writer, too. They're like, oh, wait, no, some words wrong. But uh, here's one. You can't see it here, but I'm going to point to it anyway. They've gone through and worked out the stanchion in several lines of a poetic line to figure out, OK, how, did this, how does this line work rhythmically? Only a poet's going to do that. Um, and so you've got it going from one person then to another person who is also a poet. And then finally, the third person who did all of these collages, which, however, are not entirely random, because most of the collages do actually have to do with the subject matter of the poems they're being pasted over or with, although they also sometimes paste it over the text. But then the other thing that you can kind of feed into here is the fact that the bookseller I bought it from, they said they didn't remember the problem. So like, I don't remember that book. I'm like, how do you not remember that book? A, it looks like this, and B, you sold it to me a week ago. But anyway, they couldn't tell me where it came from. But they had a whole collection on sale at the same time of uh, Serbian surrealism, which you combine that with a bunch of collage in an avant-garde book from 1830, and you have some pretty interesting possibilities opening up over who might have owned this, and even the provenance of how did this thing get passed around. And if that is the case, how did it end up in Eastern Europe? You know, and there are obviously pretty interesting routes that could have happened. We don't know. But there is a lot of personalization in this book. Everybody who owned this was like, no, this is, this is mine. And I've got my own marginalia in there, too, because I think I've probably got, that's probably fine. <laughs> Uh, and then one more Gautier book. This one, we open it up. Bibliothèque de Gustave Le Bon. Does Gustave Le Bon ring any bells to anybody? No neo Nazis in the place? <laughs> <laughs> Gustave Le Bon was a late 19th century uh, scientist? Anyway, uh, he basically was the, the main person in the late 19th century defending white supremacy on scientific grounds, trying to say, well, look at how the skulls are shaped, this and this and this. Um, also, he was, a, he was a huge enemy of the avant-garde. He wrote an entire book talking about the avant-garde as proof of the degeneracy of Western culture. We were becoming feminized, we were becoming you know, weak and becoming all of this stuff. So horrible, horrible man. He was reading Gautier's History of Romanticism, the book about the founding of the avant-garde, which tells us this is almost certainly he was reading this in order to write his smear campaign against the avant-garde. The only corrections he's made in here are to correct typos, which also tells me a lot about this man. <laughs> um, at the same time, he definitely read it because look at the, look at this, you know what I mean? It tells us that he was reading, it tells us he's, he's reading like this. He's got his, like, he's always, I mean, not that he's rubbing it like this, but, like, you're, he's not holding it like this when he reads, right? Um, it's, it's remarkably beat up, really. So it is interesting that he only does those marginalia, but he's obviously, he was using the book a lot. Um, 
So that's just an example of kind of like all these books, all from one author, which I think is interesting, that this, this author elicits this response from people. Somehow when that interchange is happening in reading, his possession seems to be a little bit more effective um, than, than some others. So, um, yeah. Okay, back to some children's stuff. Here, this isn't a children's book, but it's a book a child got hold of. Um, Narratives of the Sufferings of Lewis and Milton Clark Among the Slaveholders of Kentucky. So this is a, uh, a slave narrative, basically, which was um, sold among the abolitionist community. Um, so, uh, so that in itself is interesting, that we're like, okay, this is, and what you see in here is a, a lot of names of this family, even the extended family. This book got passed around throughout generations and throughout the extended family. So you could see how these communities are working here. You know what I mean? They're passing it around. And eventually the kid ends up with it and starts drawing all over it. Again, talking about kids trying to figure out who they are, trying to, you know, a lot of what we have in here is, um, is uh, this guy named Roswell Dow. It looks like he's just obsessively writing his name over and over and over and over again. I think what he was doing was learning to write, right? But you get to see this process, and you can even see some of, you know, you can tell sometimes which of these are earlier and which of them are later. Um, there are you know, math problems on here, all kinds of things, you know, years written for no apparent reason. So it just gets used as a scratch pad, so all this daily life just like right there. Um, so again, I did some research into this, and this, the, the coolest part of it is this flyleaf at the back where he's drawn a couple of people. I don't know whether they're supposed to be people he knows or random people or people from the book, but you know, they're sitting there. This clearly like 18, you know, 1840s, 1850s clothing here, um, which is really fun, I think. Kind of a tragic story, though. I'll pass it around. But um, looking into the research, this family was unfortunate. So the father was James S. Durant. The daughter was Sophia Durant Dow and some other people. I can't figure out who they were. Roswell Dow was, was the grandson. He's the one that did the most stuff. Um, Sophia, his mother, was in 1846 committed to the uh, Vermont Asylum of the Insane for life. She lived the rest of it. She lived, I think, the last 40 years of her life in this insane asylum. I don't know why. Um, but she was, she was put in there the same year this book was published. And her name is in there. So I don't know whether that means that she wrote her name in there as she was, whatever was happening was happening, or whether it means that she um, was, uh, that her family was writing her name, trying to, you know, like her son, just like, I'll write mom's name, which is even sadder. Even more sad, the same year, 1846, two other people in their extended family both committed suicide. Don't know why. Roswell, who wrote The Kid, he grew up to become a sharpshooter in the Civil War, um, which makes sense with the abolitionism, not that you necessarily need that, but the sharpshooters were a unit that you were drafted into. Um, in 1866, as soon as he got out of the army, he was committed to the same insane asylum as his mother and lived there for the rest of his life. Don't know why. But, um, and, and not only that, there were a couple of other pe members of their family also committed to the asylum, all of them on different campuses of the asylum, so chances are they didn't ever even really see each other. And I don't know what's behind that story, but clearly it's something horrific, you know. And probably that's why it's not in the newspapers. It was probably something that in the 1840s was not going to get reported, whatever that. But that doesn't narrow it down much. It's the 1840s. Um, so Sophia died in 1872 there, and Roswell, her son, as of 1910, he was still a ward of the state. So. I didn't have this book yet when they were, I was told they were haunted, but it would probably be a prime candidate for that because these were not happy people. Um, but also people who were obviously socially committed, you know, so it's an interesting thing. Um, how horribly am I doing on time? <laughs> Only kind of horribly. You're 54 minutes. 
What's that? Fifty four minutes on the camera. Okay. Okay, so we're actually not too bad. Okay. Um, okay. This is an intensely, I don't know if haunted, but this is an intensely personalized book. Um, when I first bought it, um, I didn't even know what it was. I just, it, it was sold by a, it wasn't sold by a bookseller, it was sold by like a thrift shop or something, so you, there's no information. Like, this is like an old book. I can't find really a title page. I don't know. There's, you know, like, okay. But they had a few images of the inside. I was like, I don't know what that book is, but I probably need it. It took a while to figure it out. Um, what it is, um, and it, so really this was a matter of like, it's like in a horror movie, if you, you need to figure out who the ghost is, and that's what a lot of the stuff has been, right? Um, so, you know, looking at that, I was like, okay, what's happening here? It's an omnibus, which is a form that we don't have very much anymore. In the 19th century, m most books were sold unbound. Um, so you would buy the pages because the technology didn't exist to print and bind in the same establishment. And so the, the, the pricing would have been ridiculous. So you would go to the bookstore, buy your unbound pages, and then you would go and get them bound at a bookbinder. Um, so an omnibus is basically something where people just take a bunch of their favorite books and they just get them all bound in one volume. Um, and so that's what this is, so that's a part of a clue, certainly why the person was like, I don't know what this is, why does it have 18 title pages? Um, so that was one thing. And then a lot of the printed, there are printed dates, but a lot of these have a later date handwritten after it. So I'm like, okay, that's interesting, I don't know what to make of that. Um, a lot of the stage directions, in these plays, they're all plays, they're all operas actually. A lot of the stage directions have little dashes and numbers written next to them or kind of on top of them. Like, okay, what's happening there? And then you have all of these hand written, so like here's some of these, like, you know, little X to X in a line. And then you've got. It's a cut. It's, no spoilers, Julie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, four, three, one. And then you have all of these handwritten, pasted in bits. So like, here's a little one. It's just, this is handwritten very small on a very thin piece of paper and carefully pasted in over the text. And you have a bunch of that. Here's, here's another one. You'll find them all over here when I pass it around. In the... Yeah, and then little marginal notes written in there, but the marginal notes also were crazy because some of them are in pen and are very nice. Some of them are in pencil, and I was like, <sighs> like, and I'm like, what is happening here? Finally figured it out. This is what it was. This belonged to a stage director in the provinces. So what happens is, you if you're going to produce a play in the provinces, you don't go like the, the way that you get the script is to just go and buy the script in Paris, and then you take it to Lyon, and you use it to put it on. So that explains part of it, right? So the, the written in dates, those are the dates that the, the provincial premiere was, like his premiere. So you've got that. Um, but you know what, you, you can get away with a lot more in Paris than you can in the provinces, hence the cuts and hence the redactions and the rewritings, which is very common in the 19th century to just rewrite whole sections of operas and, and, and plays, even music some, a lot of the time. Or be like, we need to have a dance in here, jam a dance in the middle of it, whatever. We'll have Offenbach write it. It's, you know, we'll still call it Beethoven. Like, okay. <laughs> so that's what some of those things are. Um, the, the numbers are blocking instructions. And during this line, this character goes to this part of the stage. Right? Um, and the weird handwriting, you're at home being like, all right, how am I going to do this? You're writing it nicely. But then you show up, you show up to rehearsal, and you're up on a ladder somewhere trying to fix something, and the director is like, no, that's not how it's got to go. You got to go over there. They can't do that costume change. You're like, all right, I'll make the change. 
different situations, you write different ways, right? So this is kind of the most, I'm probably more proud of the detective work on this book than, than almost anything that I've done. Um, and really, really, really fascinating book. Um, all right. This, this just, I mean, tell me this isn't haunted. <laughs> it's got it. It's a medical dictionary. Uh, so it's a French medical dictionary. So it's certainly seen a lot of death. It's certainly been around death a lot. It has a lot of stains. I don't know what they are. Um, at the same time, I mean, having said that, I don't think, I hope, that they're not like sitting there doing surgery with a medical dictionary next to them. Like, what is this? Let's look it up. But <laughs> it's more like a chloroform the blood, you know what I mean? Um, but uh, but it, it even looks like, when I was saying earlier, books die and decay and are corpses just like humans. This is, I think, a good example of that. Um, it was first used during the French Revolution, which certainly gives you some opportunities. Um, in 1839, we have another thing where the owner's, the older owner's name gets very carefully, it's completely crossed out. So again, I don't know what that's about. It was clearly used as a textbook by a lot of people. As you can tell, when at the end, people were studying their Greek, and then uh, also weirdly trying to scan Latin poetry. So one of these medical students also wanted to be a poet, which is also interesting that a lot of the romanticist poets did start up. Berlioz started as a doctor, or in medical school. He never actually made it to it. Uh, but like, there are a lot of, a lot of people who, who did start out, um, start out as doctors and ended up in the avant-garde. Not that Berlioz was a poet, but... Um, and here's the weird thing. A little bit of a pasted on thing at the end with a bunch of like two letters at the edge of the page. I have no idea what this could possibly have served, but kind of, I don't know. Um, yeah, so just kind of interesting little things like I wouldn't really expect to have in there. Um, and that is one I, it's gonna, it's gonna be, it's, it's already in bad shape, I know. All right. This is, again, a lot of these are things that I, I got very cheaply. This is like eight bucks. It's an, uh, uh, an omnibus of two Lord Byron poems from, printed in two different cities by two different publishers. Um, and it's in America, it's 1814. This is not rare in any regard. You know, Lord Byron's all over the place by that time. Um, and the, the first, you open it up, it says, Merry Christmas, Uncle Walter, 1981. I'm like, all right, cool. But then you turn the page, and it says Laura Woolsey in a much older script, obviously. And you're like, okay, well, who is that? Turns out she's pretty interesting. She was from a leading family in Connecticut. Her uncle and her brother were both presidents of Yale University. Um, so she was a highly educated woman, most likely, even if she wasn't in school. Chances are she was reading a lot. Um, she would have been probably a teenager when she owned this, if she was the first owner, which seems to be the case. Um, her, uh, either her daughter or her granddaughter, I'm not sure which it was, but they were a magazine writer during uh, the first part of the century and were in the woman's who's who of America in 1915, or what that's worth. So highly intellectual family. Um, she was married to William Samuel Johnson, who was a state senator and a trustee of the New York Society Library. Um, and what I think is most interesting for her, she graduated from the Litchfield Female Academy, which was one of the first, if I want to say the first, uh, women's college in the United States. So again, a highly educated woman. Not true. Oberlin. Is it? First. Oh, was Oberlin first? Okay. That make, well, but it was, that, was it a women's academy or an admitted woman? Well, it, it, it was the first to admit to woman. Okay. I think Litchfield might be the first, like, all-female academy. I'm not sure, but it was definitely one of the early ones. Um, and, uh, although Oberlin is awesome, don't get me wrong. I, <laughs> Oberlin's the first in a lot of things. I think the first, they were the first to admit African Americans, too, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, so she graduated from the Litchfield Female Academy, which I think is pretty interesting. And, uh, what, there's not a whole lot of marginalia in here, but sometimes the fact that there's not much can 
kind of put that much more interest in what there is. She has marked one passage that I found. Up rose, up rose the dervis, dervis, I think it's supposed to be dervish, except it's 18, you know, 19th century orthography. Up rose the dervis with that burst of light, nor less his change of form appalled the sight. Up rose that dervis, not in saintly garb, but like a warrior bounding from his bar. Apparently that was the sweetest part of this entire book. Um, <laughs> so you're just like, okay, I don't know. Um, you can wonder. And I, I feel like somewhere in there too, I don't have it marked anymore, I think there is a, a, a little passage about like love that's in there, which I feels to me like, okay, that makes kind of sense, because she was probably, I think, 14 or 15 when she bought it, so. Um, let me see. And talking about that thing of like things finding people, um, I'm gonna. This is uh, so this is a. I showed an image of this at the lecture yesterday. Um, this is a copy or an, an issue of like Weppa, which is one of the first kind of proto zines. You can't have a zine before you can print at home, but self-published um, romanticist avant-garde zine um, on. Uh, Printed on recycled paper. So if you open this up, you can see that the flyleaf is, is just a recycled piece oh, wow. from a different book. This is the illustration that was remaindered and they reused the paper because he's paying for this himself. Um, so I'll pass this around because it's cool. Do be, this is one of the more, I've got a lot of issues of it. This one's actually better shaped than a lot. But then I picked up uh, a later um, reprint of it. And the person who had, who had done these had gone through, they'd made a box, this was not sold as a box set, they couldn't apparently afford to um, actually bind them in hardcover, so they took the paper you use on the inside of the hardcover and just bound the soft covers in it, which I've never seen before. But again, it tells you this is somebody who really loved the books and really cared, but also was very, was not able to afford to like treat it like you were supposed to treat a book. Um, you know, and they're in pretty good shape. Um, so this is a, this is 1855, he brought it back and, you know, but the thing that is really particularly interesting about it is that um, when I, when it arrived, I pulled some of the books out of here and tucked in between, which the bookseller had not noticed, was a letter. And it's one of those things where you're like, a letter, that's cool. You're like, no, it would be cool to be a, uh, anyway. <laughs> and I open it up and I'm like, this looks like familiar handwriting, which also says something about me. Um, and I open it up and I'm like, no, that's definitely Gustav Carr's signature. And I looked up. I've got, a 19, I've got an issue of a 19th century book collector's magazine that has signatures of famous living people, and they had an example of Gustav Carr's signature, so I'm like, no, that is definitely him. And it is a letter of him talking, uh, it's a letter written during the Paris Commune, that he, that he wasn't in Paris, but it's during the Franco-Prussian War, talking about his problems with the provisional government at the time, and how they were not treating refugees well. Um, and I don't know who it was to, but who, whoever it was, what it also tells you is that whoever it was that had this, clearly it wasn't somebody who could afford to buy a letter. This was somebody who knew Gustav Carr and didn't have money, which also is like, yeah, that sounds like the avant guard. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of stick this in here like this. You can take it out and look at it just so that it don't get separated. Which way am I? <laughs> so that was one of those things where I was just like, okay, that seems uncannily fortuitous to me. Um, all right, let me see. I can get through this. This is small. Okay. Um, this is a surrealist, uh, surrealist book about the about the uh, romanticist avant-garde, um, published in the 1940s. And it was owned by a guy who was writing a book that never got published. I have not been able to find anything else about him. Now I can't find what I'm looking for. There it is. 
Um, but his name was, uh, yeah, but his name was W. Kessel Beeler. I don't know who he was, but he left some of his research notes in here. He left a fair amount of marginalia in here. So I know that he was particularly interested, probably writing a book about Aloysius Bertrand, is what I can gather. And then there are other places where the book isn't even cut. Like if you don't know, like a lot of older books, you have to actually cut every fourth page apart with a book knife. So a lot of the time when somebody, you can tell something about whoever owned it by what they cut and what they don't. Um, so you can look in here and be like, this guy was not interested in, uh, who was it um, that I noticed they were not interested in? Somebody none of you have heard of, so it probably doesn't matter. But anyway, you can, you can look at certain people and be like, okay, he was not interested in this, but he was interested in this, and then there's marginalia on here. But even his marginalia about Petrus Burrell goes back to Aloysius Bertrand. So you have this little kind of view into a book that was never written, you know, um, with, with just these research notes and everything kind of tipped in there, written in there, and all that other stuff. I talked about Nerval also being one of those people who people really kind of identify with deeply when they read. This is a copy of Gerard de Nerval. Um, I mean, he, was, he died in 1855, I want to say. Um, this, is, this edition is from the 1940s, so it's not an early edition. But it was bought by David Gascoigne, who was one of the English surrealists in Paris uh, in December of, actually, that's probably, I don't know. The, that's, I, either December 5th or, uh, or the 12th of May, 1948, um, which is presumably when he was visiting the Paris Surrealist group and picks up Nerval. Um, and what, there's, and for this one, there's not much in here that shows like, that he read it, but he did used to go to bars dressed up as Gerard de Nerval and <laughs> pretend to be him, apparently. So clearly he was using this book or a different, copy of, of Nerval. Um, which way am I going? I forget. Anyways. You guys don't have to go this way out. <laughs> Alright, almost done here. This one is uh, The Bible of Nature. It's like an early Unitarian tract, basically. Uh, the Bible of Nature and Substance of, your, of Virtue. And you've got here a uh, Yes, it's um, a, a kind of a, a weird image of a woman with six or seven breasts and a bunch of kids all sucking on them at once. And there's a priest and a Native American standing side by side, and something's on fire, and it says, Revelation of Nature, Reason, Humanity, Justice. Um, so it's this very strange kind of syncretic, utopian religious text uh, from 1849, um, which uh, belonged to somebody named Maurice McClue, or McClure, McClue, I think, and somebody named uh, Lydia Moody, um, uh, and then a guy named Robert, uh, I'm sorry, I'm moving ahead of myself. So Lydia Moon, Lydia Moon is what it is. So the family that owned this, I did a little bit more research, they ended up, the, uh, when they bought this, they were in, I want to say, Indiana. But they eventually went out west with the Mormons, and the, uh, the husband became high up in the Mormon church under uh, John Smith, interestingly, which is just a little bit of a, I, this is not Mormon, but it's, I guess, a stepping stone <laughs> to Mormonism, apparently. Uh, I'll go this way. And finally, clarity. So I already passed around a, uh, the um, invoice for Jules Clarity ordering books. This is a book by him about the Paris Commune. Um, uh, or this, well, one volume of it. Um, it wasn't actually until I had this for about a year before I actually came across, tipped into it, um, this card in here, which says, 
I certify that the enclosed articles are bona fide gifts from a member of the armed forces of the United States on duty outside the continental limits of the United States and under public law 790 are entitled to free entry. Um, Robert Filson, um, private, all this other stuff. So this is a book about Paris being taken over and then having a bunch of civilians slaughtered, which was bought by an occupying American soldier during World War II when they were occupying Paris, having liberated it from the Nazis. Whether they actually read French and were like, oh, this is a beautiful irony, or whether they were like, this has got some really cool illustrations, I think my mom would love it. I don't know. But this kind of interesting thing of, you know, it, yeah, kind of just this one little clue in here. Um, Look that around. Finally, um, I'm not going to talk about this too much, but this is another omnibus um, of illustrated stories, and not much done with it, but I, I find these omnibi, I don't know if that's the right word, but I'm assuming it is because I like it, uh, are really, that they automatically tell you something about whoever owned it, because this is their, it's, it's, basis, it's a 19th century mixtape. That's exactly what it is. But it takes a very long time to get through. Um, but just like a mixtape, you look at this and you can figure out who was this person, what was going on with it, with them. Um, at least some aspect of their lives. So. Um, and this is the last thing I'm going to pass around. And this is a fair copy book, which, again, one of these things that when I got it, it took me a while. What is this? Um, when it comes around, and this is in, I mean, it, be careful with it, not because it isn't already messed up, just because it is. Um, but uh, they've just gone through and copied out all of their favorite poems in calligraphy. And this was, again, kind of a 19th century form of kind of almost like a mixtape, you know. And you can kind of see, you know, where does this person taste lie? I mean, the whole short story is in here. Um, other little things tipped in, you know, um, and a lot of, even sign, like this looks like it's by Francois Cope, the way it's signed, it's not, it's just some guy. But again, even more personalized, it's like an omnibus, but you also have the handwriting, which famously is like, you know, one of the kind of repositories of the personality. So, I'll pass that around, and uh, I'm guessing I'm probably out of time now, so it should work. <laughs> so, uh, I might actually, how long has it been, Ralph? Huh? 117. Whoa! All right. See, we were doing good. What is going on this year? So I should waste some more time so we get behind. Um, all right, so I... Uh, or stop so we can eat. Right, yeah, that's, yeah, just let them pass around. Does anybody have questions? I don't know what questions you would have, but if you have questions, you can ask them. What do you mean by haunted books? I may have missed that. Uh, yeah, I think you do. <laughs> kind of um, the idea. Well, there's also a story behind it, which I can tell you later. But um, basically, the idea that you can evoke a dead person by looking at the marks on the book. Actually, there is one thing I wanted to talk about that reminds me of. For instance, and this is the book. Wow. So okay, if you really want to do that, really like evoke a person's how they were. Okay, so I can take a look at this book, and I can look, and if you look carefully, there are little, you can tell that right here, it's been really worn away. Right here, it's been really worn away. And then, the spine's been so worn away that the thing comes off, right? So what this means you can do is, like, you can say, well, what way of holding a book makes that happen? You can back engineer a person's posture, and the way that they hold a book, which is basically you're moving into their subconscious at that point. So you can sit down and say, okay, well, in order for this to happen, my thumb needs to be here, and then my other thumb needs to be here, but just the tip of it. In order for that to work, I have to hold it like this. It's the only way those thumbs will be where they are. And so then I have to do this, and then I open it up and say, okay, so when he read, he's reading like this, 
Okay, in order to hold the pages, it's going to have to be like this. Got to have big like hands this. too. What's that? Got to have big hands. You you do. <laughs> I'm having trouble for that yeah. reason. So it even tells you something about that, right? And then the only way you can read that is to do it like this. So it's like, and it for me to do that draws my back forward. I have to sit up straight and look down like this. So like, okay. And then you can kind of say, okay, this is what it felt like to be this person. It felt <laughs> like this. This is the way. You know, this is not the way I normally sit. I'm like, this is a very different person than me. It's a discipline. It's a dis yeah, right. And so it's, you know, and I don't know where we take that exactly, but just as you can look at a person and get a sense from the way that they're sitting, you can kind of do that. So that's kind of a, a one way it's kind of like, the ghost is in there if you can call it up. Have you ever felt like the presence of something else while you're reading an ancient book? No, um, not, not like I'm like, this is creepy. Um, Perhaps you're just not sensitive to that kind of feeling? I, I, either that, well, I don't know, yeah. Either that or it's just the way I read always, so it doesn't feel unique to me. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, but there, there is like a, there is a, a story I told in the beginning like maybe being told that some of the books were haunted. Yes. That was where it kind of came out of it. But, uh, but yeah, so it's, a, it's kind of a cheap sophistry for the, for the lecture, but not told. <laughs> um, word and yet? Oh, uh, I think you're answering it. Oh, okay. No problem. Yeah. Anything? Uh, if not, I'll just let people do whatever they want and just eventually get the books back here. You know, so. And, and then. The box, there's a box for them, get them in the box maybe. Yeah, the box over here so if anyone has Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then in a few minutes, once that's kind of cleared up and we've got our stuff together, is it post neo poems first? I is think so. Right? I think so, yeah. I think so. I that's what I wanted to switch. I can look at the door. What's that? That's what I was talking about, switch. Right, right, right. Yeah. So, yeah. So. That'll be in here, so you can stick around or you can come back or ignore it. <laughs> Whatever.